hello everyone and uh, welcome to this talk um, this is the 18th talk in the series organized by the open economics forum uh, and the so as economics department on the economics of COVID-19. In this series, we have been discussing the uh, recent economic developments pertaining to COVID-19 and its implications for, well, for the world ahead. Today, we have with us uh, Dr. Victoria Stadheim, who is a lecturer in uh, political economy at the Department of Applied Social Sciences, Forensics and Politics at the University of Winchester. She did her PhD from SOAS and her work includes her work focuses on particular on the political economy of the Eurozone crisis and its manifestations, especially in the case of Portugal. Today, she, um, just to mention, the other talks have been put up online and I will share all the um, social media handles and do follow the various profiles. Um, today, she will be discussing, well, the particular nature of the crisis uh, examined from the perspective of Marxist political economy. And, uh, well, I'll... I'll let her take it from here. Uh, if you have any questions, do please put them in the chat. And it would be nice if you could also say which country you're from. Um, so I think that's it. I will share the things. And Victoria, if you'd like to start. OK. Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. It's uh, it's great to be invited. Thank you so much for inviting me to the seminar series. It's, uh, it's really a great uh, initiative. I've uh, been following some of this. Uh, and it's also nice to be back at SOAS, even virtually. So um, thanks, um, especially thanks to Sara Stefano for organizing this and for Madhau for chairing this session. So thank you. Um, so basically what I'm going to do is to provide some reflections or some initial reflections uh, with regards to how we can understand uh, the present crisis uh, that is unfolding uh, in front of us. How is it different from other crises? Uh, which theories can inform our analysis of uh, what is going on? So these are sort of the, the situation is new, and and so are my my thoughts about it, obviously. And as I was said in the beginning, um, my, my research is primarily on on the eurozone crisis and its uh, manifestations in the case of Portugal. So I will, I will provide some reflections about the nature of the present crisis, um, particularly informed by uh, Marxist political economy. Second, uh, well, within that, I will also discuss the strategies uh, for crisis management that were implemented um, to, to address the public health crisis and, and the economic crisis. And what, what part does that play in actually shaping uh, the crisis? And then finally, I will just make some very brief points about the, the future and uh, possible policies. OK, so what type of crisis are we confronting? Um, well, first of all, we can say, and this will come as absolutely no surprise, uh, that its initial root is in human health, uh, but it's causing a deep recession. So its initial root is not, it's not a banking crisis, not a currency crisis or an inflation crisis. Its root is, is in the human being, basically. Um, so when we pose the question of what type of crisis this is, we are trying to understand its nature, its causes, and this is not a straightforward task. So uh, academics spend years and decades trying to grapple with the causes of crisis, and they, they continue to disagree, of course. We can also note that there are different types of economic crises, uh, banking crisis, currency crisis, etc. There are slow crises, prolonged crises, and very sudden crises. So the, the crisis of the 70s has been described as a sort of slow burning crisis. And in contrast, the global financial crisis was of a more kind of sudden, sudden nature. Uh, related to this is also the question of causes of crisis versus triggers of crisis. It's easy to confuse the two triggers. It was, is what initiates it. So in the case of the global financial crisis, it was defaults in the subprime uh, sector in the US. Uh, but the causes are, are deeper. Uh, they have to do with the underlying features uh, of a national economy or, or of the global economy. Um, Crisis theories uh, focus on, on different issues across the sort of economic spectrum. 
um, they focus on policy failures, monetary policy, um, aggregate demand, some focus on the falling rate of profit. Uh, one discussion with regards to the global financial crisis was whether its causes were in the sphere of finance or in the sphere of production. And well, it's important to stress that each crisis is singular and that we can ha cannot have one crisis theory that is able to account for, for every crisis. Um, we, I'm sure we have all heard um, so far that the present slowdown caused by COVID-19 is, is commonly captured as a simultaneous supply and demand shock. So a shock to production and hence supply, and at the same time a shock to demand. So, for example, we hear that um, from Financial Times and Economist, the disruption has been twofold, causing havoc on both the demand and the supply side. Um, or that supply of goods is diminished with difficulty sourcing parts and staff unable to work amid factory closures, while the restricted movement of people and social distancing has act, acted to stifle demand. Uh, so delivering a double barrel blow to the economy. So it's of course both of these things. It's both uh, supply and uh, demand. Um, but I'm going to uh, suggest a slightly different way of, of thinking uh, about the current crisis. So I'm going to use uh, Ben Fine and uh, Lawrence Harris' uh, definition of crisis from uh, the book Rereading Capital from 1979. It's very old, but I think yeah, it's, it's uh, still useful. And uh, the book is, is, is about reading capital, Marx's capital. So Fine and Harris, they define crisis as a violent interruption in the circuit of capital and as forcible changes in the progress of capitalist accumulation, not only in the pace of accumulation, but also in its internal structure. So it's about capital accumulation, about production, the circuit of capital. So violent changes, both in the, the speed, pace, and in the form of accumulation. I can also add another definition, which is quite similar, in a more recent work, Fine and Saad Filio, who was in your seminar last week, uh, similarly defined uh, crisis as forcible changes in the pace of accumulation as well as its internal structure. So these definitions uh, point us to Marx's analysis of the process of capitalist accumulation. Uh, they point, point us to what is called the, the circuit of capital. And some of you may have seen illustrations of the circuit of capital uh, in, in economic uh, books or, or in, in classes at SOAS elsewhere. But um, I will just explain briefly. Uh, the circuit of capital illustrates the accumulation of capital. So it, in, it involves the product process of production of commodities or if you want services as well. Um, and this circuit, it includes means of production. Um, and human labor or labor power. So it starts uh, with money, the illustration, um, well, it can start in several ways, but it's, it can start with money. And so money is first expended on, on capital and capital includes both labor power, so that is the hiring of workers for, for a wage and the means of production, so that's machines, different types of inputs, uh, whatever is produced. And so they interact and uh, the production happens and commodities are produced. These commodities are then sold for profit. Um, so this means that the circuit of capital includes two spheres, the sphere of production and uh, the sphere of exchange, because it includes buying uh, inputs and labor power as well as selling the, the commodity. And it also sort of illustrates uh, social relations between classes, capital and labor, um, and so forth. There is an alarm outside. I hope you can still hear me. <laughs> no, it's gone. So this is uh, commonly illustrated with M, M, then C, uh, money invested in C, then LP and MP, labor power and means of production. And this is converted into C, 
but a different type of commodity and it's sold for M money, M prime. So it ends with more money than it started. So there's value added in this process. Uh, surplus value is realized through the sale of commodities. So uh, we can observe that the present crisis takes the form of a violent interruption in the circuit of capital and a forcible change in the pace of capital ac capitalist accumulation along the lines of these definitions that I provided uh, a couple of minutes ago. So we can see an interruption in several places along the circuit. Uh, an interruption by the coronavirus and uh, in, and an interruption interruptions by created by the measures to to confront the crisis so i'm going to um, talk about three uh, types of interruptions and probably it would be possible to add many more but these are some um, initial thoughts so paradoxically while this is likely to become the deepest recession in decades its origin is neither in the sphere of production or in exchange. It is a crisis of public health and of human life. Nevertheless, COVID-19 affected the sphere of production straight away. Uh, it affects human beings through their health and therefore also labor power. Um, first, human beings as human beings. And secondly, human beings as, in their capacity as workers. So as providers of labor power. So very quickly, it affects the process of accumulation and the circuit of capital. It affects production. So usually when it is argued that crisis, um, the sources or the causes of crisis can be found in the sphere of production, it refers to something very different. Um, Marxists sometimes argue this and there are divisions between Marxists. Um, sometimes they, they, they say this to argue that uh, a crisis is caused in production, and more specifically, they're, they're referring to, to what is called Marx's law of the tendency of the profit rate to fall. And the falling rate of profit, there are slightly different theories about it, but usually it has to do with technical change um, and the relationship with, with value and so forth. So I won't go further into this. But the main point here is to say that COVID-19 as a disease, as a virus, uh, it affects uh, the sphere of production in a different way. Uh, it affects production through labor. And in this context, I think that uh, social reproduction theory is probably relevant to help us uh, add, add to this uh, our understanding of the crisis. And uh, Sara Stefano um, talked about social reproduction a few weeks ago and can say much more than I can. Um, Basically, the availability of human beings uh, as wage workers is an essential starting point for capitalist accumulation to take place. And Marx stressed this, and this is an historical process. Um, an historical process is required for uh, human beings uh, to be available as wage workers. Um, so Marx identifies uh, labor power or the capacity to labor as a special commodity um, that the capitalists need to set the system in motion and to keep it running. So um, labor power has the, in, in inverted comma, peculiar property of being a source of value because it creates commodities and value for capitalism. Uh, however, the existence and availability of labor power needs to be explained. And this is where social reproduction theory comes in. So Marx does this kind of historically, but fem uh, Marxist feminists have, have, have sort of developed the analysis of what is required for uh, labor power to exist and for labor power to be uh, reproduced. <clears throat> so I'm going to just mention three uh, processes which are um, outlined as being part of the reproduction of labor power. So that is the sort of the maintenance of um, um, human beings as providers of labor, uh, the capacity to work. Um, a Marxist feminist, Titi Bhattacharya, she outlines three processes through which the reproduction of labor power takes place. One, by, by reproducing fresh workers, so through childbirth. Two, 
by activities that regenerate the worker outside the production process and allow her to return to it. So this includes food, a bed to sleep in, and also care in, in physical ways that keep the person whole. And finally, third, activities that maintain and regenerate non-workers outside of the production process. So in relation to COVID-19, it is the second aspect that is, is relevant. Um, food, bed, etc., but care in a physical way. People need to be healthy to be able to participate in the labor market or to be able to offer their labor power for, for a wage. So COVID-19 starts with human health. Uh, it attacks human beings uh, and therefore also human beings in their capacity as labor power and thereby it affects production and capitalist accumulation straight away. We can just add to this that, as we know, uh, the virus started in China, so at the heart of global factory. So this opened the possibility of a very severe disruption of global uh, supply chains. And of course, industry in China, productionist China was, was certainly affected uh, by the virus. I think in Wuhan, which was uh, the, you know, the main region in the beginning, um, Automobile production was uh, was the most important uh, sector, but we can but the, the containment of the virus in China was was very effective. So we can say that it could have been much worse in terms of uh, disturbing the, the the global factory. Then moving on, uh, coming back to the circuit of capital, a second moment of the crisis um, caused by uh, COVID nineteen. Uh, the circuit of capital uh, and process of accumulation are they're interrupted once again in a different, slightly different way. Uh, it's interrupted by the policies to contain the virus. So governments across the world stepped in and implemented the great lockdown as well as social distancing measures. So by seeking to stop the spread of the virus, they simultaneously put capital accumulation on hold. Uh, that is a sudden interruption in the pace of capital accumulation. Um, so, as we know, lockdowns and social distancing measures prevented people from going to work. So, as a second moment of production, production uh, is disrupted once again. Uh, this time through labor, directly through labor, labor, human beings as labor power and not as human beings outside of the sphere of production. Um, so that means that when we look at the economic crisis generated by the virus, um, the state in a particular way is a major source of it. Uh, the state needs to form part of our analysis of this crisis. The state action interfered in capitalist accumulation. So usually the, the state often comes up in discussions about crisis, but Usually when the, the state is a source of crisis, it means something very different. It's about fiscal profligacy, policy failures, the Greek government has spent beyond its means, and things like that. Um, so that's not what I mean. I'm not saying it in that sense. I'm not saying it to blame the state. The state had to create an economic crisis if it were to save lives, at least at a certain stage in the con contagion of the virus. So, of course, lockdown, we know this. Lockdowns and social distancing measures, uh, they had a huge impact on the world of work. And in April, um, the ILO wrote in, in one of its reports that uh, the proportion of workers living in countries with recommended or required workplace closures has decreased from 81 to 68% over the last two weeks mainly driven by the lifting of workplace closures in China. So, in other words, earlier on it was 81% proportion of workers uh, living in countries with required workplace closures and so forth. So, that is a, a huge part of the global working population that was uh, potentially affected by um, restrictions in terms of going to work of one kind or another. But the same report says that 80% of employers and 66% of own account workers um, live in working countries affected by uh, such measures. 
Um, and it says that uh, it speaks of an unprecedented reduction in economic activity and, and working time. So, yes, the, for the state to basically stop capitalist accumulation, or not stop it entirely, but uh, slow it down significantly, this is, of course, uh, in normal times, this is absurd. It's entirely against the logic of, of capitalist accumulation. Capitalism always has to move in order to work. It has to be constantly on the move. Um, so this is strange. Um, of course, some might say that actually the state didn't interrupt capitalism uh, or put it on hold. It saved it. Well, in a sense, that's also true. If we think in terms of capitalist accumulation, if many people lose their lives or have ill health um, from the point of view of capital, uh, it won't work either. Uh, and like one, I think it was a sage member said um, something to the effect that if people don't, uh, people don't produce any value when they are dead. So one might, one might, might say that lockdowns and social distancing measures put a temporary break on capitalist accumulation. Um, well, it did that in the medium term, it was needed not only to save human lives, but also capitalism. Um, state intervention uh, in the form of lockdowns also affected the circuit of capital in a third way, uh, through the sphere of exchange, through demand. The implementation of lockdowns uh, and social distancing led to a collapse in aggregate demand, as we know, um, and it affected exchange if we think of this circuit, it affected the sphere of exchange within it and the realization of surplus value. Commodities were left unsold. So, uh, to sum up so far, um, COVID-19 is initially not an economic crisis, uh, but a human health crisis, but it affected the sphere of production through labor straight away. And in a second moment, um, capital accumulation was affected once again through lockdowns and social distancing measures. Um, oops. Um, so it's it's affected both through through production and uh, exchange. I will just uh, well part of what I've said has been about crisis management, <clears throat> but I will just uh, provide a few very um, brief points uh, on that. To understand uh, a crisis, we need to look at the strategies for crisis management. Um, policies that are implemented to address an economic crisis might help to get out of recession, but it might also do the opposite. Um, it might deepen a recession, as many would argue that the austerity and internal devaluation did uh, when it was implemented in, in the context of the Eurozone crisis. Um, so we can say that crisis management can shape the trajectory and anatomy of an economic crisis. So, but in the case of uh, a pandemic, which leads to a recession, the, the task of assessing the policies of crisis management is different um, for the obvious reason that there is a public health and an economic aspect. Um, so what characterized the management of this public health and economic crisis? Well, I will just briefly say that there's a huge deal of national variegation. Uh, on the one hand, we've had uh, responses from authoritarian right-wing governments uh, with leaders that have expressed either outright uh, skepticism of the coronavirus or at the very least failed to grasp uh, the, the danger of the, the, the disease and to take it seriously, marked also by geopolitical rivalries, uh, conspiracy theory directed at China, as well as bottom-up support uh, expressed through protest export, uh, support for leaders, so particularly the US, Brazil, um, the UK's more subtle version of, of some of these elements. And on the other hand, we, we, we know about many countries that have been successful in containing the virus through different strategies, implementing manual contract tracing early on, uh, testing, social distancing measures, uh, including internal travel restrictions and so forth, uh, at a much earlier stage. Uh, some of them implemented uh, complete lockdowns very early on. Others were able to avoid um, implementing full-scale full, full scale lockdowns. So I, I just want to mention also that in Europe, I don't, there is not a one-to-one, -one, or in the Eurozone as well, 
there is not a one-to-one -one relationship between um, state capacity and economic policy space on the one hand and the ability to, to tackle the pandemic on the other hand among the most successful countries in terms of um, well the the effects of, of the disease are our peripheral eurozone countries that were subjected to harsh austerity measures and structural adjustment in in the previous crisis in the eurozone crisis and these measures included the health sector so Portugal uh, had 1,522 deaths so far. Um, for a long time, it, it was considerably lower, uh, but comparatively, it's, it's still low. Um, and, and this is, in a sense, impressive, uh, particularly given its border with Spain. Um, Greece has only 185 deaths uh, so far. And in the case, how much time do I have? Um, yeah. In the case uh, of the UK, I want to elaborate on the various measures because I'm sure um, many people here will have followed that very, very closely. Um, but I would argue that at heart of the public health crisis and the recession is a spectacular failure to protect human lives and to take the virus seriously at an early stage. Um, this, of course, you know, in many ways, it's it exposed the true colors of the society, a deeply hierarchical society. Um, at heart of this crisis is also a complete unwillingness to take any lessons from other countries. There were lessons to be learned early on. They could have paid attention to Italy, they could have uh, learned from Asian economies, but they let the virus get out of control here. Uh, social distancing measures were initially left to voluntary market uh, decisions uh, taken by individuals, please don't go to the pub. Uh, and they waited to implement the lockdown until the public was ready to obey, thus when thousands and thousands had died. So if testing, PPE, contract tracing and so forth had been in place early on, many lives could have been saved and perhaps a full lockdown would, would not have been necessary. Um, thus, and, and of course the lockdown played such an important role in, in creating the recession, so perhaps that was at least the degree, the degree of it um, could have been avoided. The, the scale of mortality has also been consistently toned down um, by the government's uh, press conferences until the death toll surpassed Italy when it was suddenly too early to make international comparisons. So and I think the whole time they've hidden between two mantras, we're taking the right steps at the right time and we are guided by the science. Both of these measures justifies just about anything at any time. Um, so what next? There is much that we don't know about what will come in the, the future. Uh, and are we talking about the global economy, uh, national economies, uh, and so forth? Uh, much will, of course, depend on how the actual pandemic develops, when there will be a vaccine, and so forth. Uh, the epicenter of the pandemic has, of course, moved from, from Europe to Latin America. Um, that's what the official numbers tell us. And we see new outbreaks in China. So the virus itself and its outbreaks uh, will be a major uh, determination in terms of the depth and duration of the recession. And on top of this, there are other kind of drivers of recession depending on countries or so oil prices oil prices have fallen by almost 50 percent uh, in the last crisis commodity prices were uh, a very important um, mechanism of transmission um, of the crisis to, in, in developing and in emerging economies um, capital flight poses a huge uh, challenge for developing countries foreign exchange earnings um, etc uh, but one thing that is for sure is that public debt will be a key feature of, or even a permanent feature in, in many parts of the world. Um, we might see very high public debt combined with extremely high unemployment. Specifically about the UK, we don't know the scale of this yet. There has been a job retainment scheme which I think was a good idea to implement, but we don't know um, 
whether it will have been effective. Some many employers uh, will have used the furlough scheme, but may nevertheless let go of their workers. So one key question is about what will happen with this public debt? Will this lead to a sort of accelerated austerity, continuity of austerity, or will it lead to a break with that? Will it be possible to pay back um, this this level of debt? Um, perhaps the public debt will be so high that it will force uh, you know a, a paradigmatic change in terms of uh, how we approach public debt and 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 fiscal policy. Of course, uh, for many years, the idea that one should, shall always pay back the debt, whether it's individuals or states, that has been sort of an important mantra. Will that simply be impossible? Will there have to be some kind of ordered restructuring of debt? Um, then very high unemployment is a possibility. And um, and in, in, in that context, so, so in terms of the public debt, we could see that huge pressure on, on public debt uh, triggered by you know, increasing interest rates, um, speculation and so forth. And I think uh, you know, the, the loose monetary policy, continuation with loose monetary policy will be important to, to avoid that. But of course, in the case of the Eurozone crisis, um, high, high, high interest rates and in public debt, you know, that was um, speculation, et cetera, that uh, contributed to forcing a, a you know a profound restructuring. Um, yes, and there may be a need for of course a huge employment generation program, uh, a green new deal perhaps, simultaneous job creation and an environmental shift. So yeah, I think I'll I'll leave it there. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Ooh, many Diane, questions. Thanks for that very yes. enlightening lecture. Um, how would you like it? Would you like? It? Yeah. Would you like to ask the questions uh, one at a time, or? Uh, sure. Yeah. Should lecture. I read them, or are you reading them? No, I'll read them. Yeah. Um, no, sir. Um, I think the first thing that we maybe we can discuss that uh, is quite pertinent to the last part of your lecture from Raza Rahman is that what does it mean for what does the virus mean for the future of labor and what are the implications for precarious work and precarity? Okay, yeah, the the world of labor. Okay, I suppose this might be a potentially very uh, depressing uh, topic. Um, of course, ma many people have lost their jobs uh, already. Um, I think in the UK, as I mentioned, uh, there is much that we haven't yet seen. It depends what will happen when the government scales back the, the furlough scheme, the job uh, retention scheme. So we could see huge increases in, in, in unemployment. We already have, a, a, I don't know, if maybe some people here have actually seen it. I haven't been able to go to London recently for obvious reasons. Um, but we read about like a, a new group of homeless people from the um, service sector, um, restaurants, hotels, and so forth. So, you know, on the one hand, uh, for a moment, we, we saw all these alternatives like, oh, wow, the homeless people were, were given hotels, but at the same time, uh, we have a new group of homeless people, and of course that's connected to the labor market. And um, so unemployment of, you know, we, we don't know the full extent. Who will um, who will be the first ones to go? Of course, uh, the UK has a, a huge amount of so-called precarious workers. The issue of casualization is is a defining feature of of the labor market here. And precariousness, what does it uh, mean? It refers to various types of so-called irregular employment from, from fixed term contracts to contracts such as self-employment, zero hour contracts, uh, and so forth, the, the gig economy, and, uh, et cetera. And uh, many of these will be very easy to fire, easy to make redundant. They will be the first ones to go, and we see it uh, clearly in the case of the university sector, which I kind of um, I'm, I'm part of. Uh, the um, 
yeah, the, the, the casualized workforce in, in universities are amongst many workforces who are who are extremely vulnerable. Um, of course, it will become more difficult to get a job. Uh, also, I think uh, working life for those who maintain their jobs will change. Um, there will be pressures to accept things that have been perhaps unthinkable so far. Um, when there is this immediate threat of unemployment, people are willing to accept much more. Um, there is no doubt that many businesses will be confronted in real crisis, and I'm not saying that um, this is an invented situation at all, but, but in addition to the, the very real pressures, a crisis can also offer opportunities for employers to implement measures that they might have fantasized about before, but I've been able to, unable to, to implement. And those things can have to do with working time arrangements, so-called flexible working hours that might benefit employers uh, far more than employees, uh, working pay, forms of contractual arrangements, uh, and so forth. And then I think uh, there is one other uh, aspect which um, has come up and that uh, hasn't really been discussed so much, uh, I don't think in the academic literature at least, is with regards to working from home. So for the time being, like being able to work from home is, is a privilege because you are able to protect yourself against the virus and in certain jobs you, you, you have that opportunity, whereas in other jobs, sort of essential workers uh, don't have the opportunity to avoid human contact. Um, but in the longer term, well, it, it's possible that this will become much more generalized, much more permanent. And well, maybe, well, some people see benefits from this, but at the same time, that implies that you know, employers will save a huge amount of money on offices. It implies that we are lending out our homes to employers. So in a sense, it's a huge transfer from employees to employers. Okay. Okay, yeah, thank you for that. Um, actually, if I, um, a question asked by Sophia earlier on. Uh, it yeah. sort of it sort of follows on from this in that she mentions that in particular, say, the garment industry, where okay. labor is mainly performed by women of color. What do you think? Uh, how do you think this would affect, as you've been mentioning, the world of work? But in terms of a particular industry, um, in terms of, I, th I think, especially you know, inc increased exploitation or um, increased precarity. Okay. Hmm. Interesting question. The garment industry. Um, okay. I, I don't work specifically on the garment industry myself. It sort of comes into some of my work because it's been an important industry in, in, in Portugal. Um, specifically in Portugal, at one point there was uh, quite a lot of discussion about uh, a revival of, of um, textile, certain textile goods, like production of, of PP, uh, so production of, of masks and so forth. So perhaps for certain businesses in certain economies, this, you know, this could be, uh, uh, well, an opportunity to produce something that is very much um, needed in, in the global economy. Then women, etc., in the garment industry, uh, I, I, this is not at all sort of my my area of expertise, but uh, I suppose some of that work uh, happens in the factory. Some of it happens within home. I know Alessandra Mesadra uh, from SOAS has analyzed the sort of nexus between um, productive work and reproductive work and the nexus between the factory real and the home and the integration of um, home female home workers. Um, into the garment sector in, in India. So I, I suppose you could say that people who are integrated into the labor market through these forms of contractual arrangements are, uh, well, extremely vulnerable to, to redundancies. They're very easy to get rid of. Um, so they're vulnerable in, in that situation. And I guess there will be a sort of nexus between formality and informality in this type of 
uh, setting as well. But it will depend partly on the demand, the global demand for what they produce. Yeah. All right, thanks. Okay, uh, so then our question from uh, Dr. Sara Stefano. Um, hmm. what, what she's asked is that what many people have been talking about, sort of the, the, the oppositional relationship between we see between the economy and public health. And yeah. Okay. How how it's in, how how you know how true is that, and how much has it been visible here? That is the economy managed, you know, in opposition to the promotion of uh, health outcomes and. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, uh, I haven't totally sort of decided on on, on that question. Um, well, clearly we see that so -called, the so-called needs of the economy, as if the economy just except, exists out there uh, without us being part of it. The economy has certain needs. The economy or capitalism has a need uh, to be in movement in order to kind of stay afloat. Uh, when people stop going to work, when they fail to pay back the mortgages and so forth, everything can spiral out of control. Uh, so, like, there is this need of the logic of the system, uh, which is sort of in contrast with the needs of, of, of public health or of individual health. Um, but at the same time, it's sort of the economy versus public health. It almost assumes that um, human beings are not part of the economy. Um, and as this... Uh, expert said the sage member i think um well people don't produce much commodities when they're when they are um dead or when they are ill so in that sense of course there's a policy question also that is part of the the economy versus public health I, like i mean I, I think we need to prioritize public health we have been part of this huge failure is to you know, the failure to protect human lives, which which has created economic consequences as well, and not just human. Mm. Uh, okay, and I think, okay, one, uh, a question, another question from Sophia, and I think this is a question that so many people have been asking, is that this is the time now universal, unconditional basic income. Do you think that this is one of the possible solutions? And if so, what, you know, what, what do we need to keep in mind before implementing or having such a solution. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Many people have uh, discussed that. Um, uh, it's not something that I've been sort of very focused on, on before. I've heard that many people um, do focus on, on, on that now. Um, yes, if I mean, I, in general, I think job retention, I'd rather see job retention than universal income. But if, if we see a huge spike in unemployment, perhaps universal income will be necessary. Of course, we, like we have to, along with all other parts of public spending, we, we have to look at like what is the cost of this and what will be the general regime in terms of public debt fiscal consolidation and the idea of paying back public debt. Um, universal income, I, I don't know if it's uh, sort of massive public investment to generate jobs, if that is a better alternative or if the two can, can go hand in hand. Obviously, it doesn't have to be either or, but yeah, it, it's, it's a possibility. Yeah. Actually, I'm I'm going to ask a question that I that I wanted to ask. If that's okay. That's yeah, sure. That uh, I thought of. Especially, you know, you were mentioning, um, you know, this the sort of the unique nature of the state intervening in capitalist accumulation at this particular juncture, and whether that you know we we don't know how it's going to turn up, but whether it's saved capitalism or not. Whereas at the same time, many people are saying that many people have said that this is sort. Of Hello, I, I'm losing you. Oh, I can't hear you Sorry. now. Hi, I think Mother is having some internet difficulties. Okay. Um, so I had a question about basically what your 
thinking is about the future of the system and what coronavirus has meant, you know, for it has shown the vulnerabilities of the capitalist system. Yeah. Um, what do you think the future could be and what the future would hold? And do you think the there's political momentum enough to actually get that change that is so desperately needed? Mm, yeah. Yes. Um, we have, yeah, we have seen vulnerabilities and we have also had sort of, it may sound like I'm romanticizing, but I think we have had sort of uh, a very small opening, a very small um, image of, of something completely different, sort of, you know, homeless people being given uh, hotel accommodation, uh, no pollution because of lockdowns uh, and so forth. And we have seen that there are alternatives. We've been told for decades that there are no alternatives. Clearly, there are alternatives and the monetary is there as soon as you switch it off. Um, and it's a matter of, of, of political will and of political projects. But like, will this be a turning point in terms of economic policy? I don't know. I don't think we can take it for granted. In terms of austerity, paying back your debt, fiscal consolidation, it's possible. It's very possible that this, if I mean, if it is, if it's possible to pay it back, then it's quite likely that this will just continue, and that we will be very squeezed through taxation to pay this back, which will be in line with the sort of the previous paradigm. But we have seen that, you know, it can be different. So it's very much, technically, we know that things can be different. Uh, so it's very much a political question. Is there an alternative project? And like, I don't see like a huge popular revolt in this country about the government's failure to address the coronavirus. There is a huge revolt around racial injustice here in the UK and in, in the world. So this is, you know, this is a complete, this is a, well, the response is partly related to the coronavirus, but it's something that goes back much further historically. Um, but we would need like a, a much bigger project and a political alliances that have uh, an alternative project in terms of employment, public investment, uh, debt and monetary policy and so forth. Unfortunately, we have an opposition that is very ineffective at this point. We do not, an opposition that says that we need, uh, uh, you know, an exit strategy uh, at the time when this came, Labour Party was not what we needed at the time. So we need, you know, we need different forces to, to co-join. Uh, and it's possible that that can be done, union movements, um, perhaps Black Lives Matter, I don't know, but different progressive forces, but it would, it, it will need to be a big alliance. It can't be left to small, tiny, small left-wing groups. Yeah, I think uh, just following on from that point from, Ms., uh, from Lorenzo Monaco, the question is, uh, do you think that this will lead to a sort of class recomposition? Uh, she to asked a what? Special, to a what? class Sorry. recomposition. Class recomposition, okay. Sorry, who asked uh, that question? At the European Union, from uh, uh, Lorenza Monaco. Oh, okay. Oh, very nice. Hi, Lorenza. Um, well, I think that class, and many people will disagree, I think that class, uh, there are many things that are connected to class, but class is, uh, the determinations of class are found in, in the sort of the relations of production, so social relations. So I think this is a question about um, labor markets and, and production, people's uh, interconnection into the labor markets. Um, are they, you know, mass wage workers, self-employed, and so forth? Uh, that, so that is, yes, I think it's absolutely possible that a recomposition of class is part of uh, of of this um, violent rupture. Uh, in in the form of, of, of capitalist accumulation. So far I've, in my presentation, I talked about the change in the pace of accumulation, the speed um, caused by the virus and by government measures. But if we might see also a change in the, the form of accumulation, and that's too too early to tell. And that could consist of well changes to do with precariousness, self-employment, wage labor. Are, you know, do people mainly work from home or not? And this has pol political implications. If people only work from home, despite that we've seen like some quite amazing 
uh, events, uh, academic and political, online. Working from home means being isolated. We need to see each other. We need to meet to have political projects. Okay, I think that's the uh, last of the questions. Uh, would you like to summarize quickly if uh, we have a few minutes? Um, yeah. for you to sort of clarify. Well, uh, I just uh, want to summarize that these are some, well, initial reflections about, you know, a potential, a possible perspective for analyzing the present uh, crisis. I focus very much on sort of um, accumulation and production. There are, of course, um, other other shifts that we might see that are um, at a different scale and at a different different type of of changes, geopolitical changes, um, political projects, um, and so forth. So what I've addressed it is is just part of a big pic uh, a much bigger picture, and um, well this. Crises are often turning points. This could be uh, a turning point in a in a different way, and it's been you know, in, in very dangerous ways. I think it's um, we, we see quite dangerous things when we, when we hear about all of the kind of geopolitical rivalries that have been exacerbated in this uh, in the context of of this virus. So in terms of economic policy. You know, we need an entirely different project, and well, and and we we need a project that is peaceful, uh, which, well, you know, which, well, I'm not saying that we're confronting a, a new world war, but um, public investment that, that um, um, foster this will be will be important. Um, yeah, and thank you very much for many interesting questions. Thanks for organizing this. Uh, yeah, nice to see part of the SOAS community. Uh, uh, yeah. Thank you so much for coming. And just before ending, I'd like to say that um, on the 22nd, there's a talk, um, the Open Economics Forum uh, webinar series continues. There's a talk on the economics of COVID-19 in Africa, African feminist perspectives. Um, yeah. Hope you all can join us for that as well. And there's further talks in the coming few weeks. Um, so I would like to thank everyone for joining us and thank you especially to Victoria for her Thank talk. you very much. Thank you for uh, convening this. Um, yeah. Very much appreciate it. Okay. Have a lovely afternoon. Bye. Thank you. Bye.